So we proceed with uh, with the story of Exodus. Now it's today is the seventh sermon, and today's sermon is about live with joy that cannot be hidden in faith. Let's start and read in Exodus chapter 14, starting with verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward, lift up their staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea and on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so they shall, they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host, of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. So last we went through chapters 13 and 14. After the Passover event, the Israelites left Egypt and followed God's pillar the pillar which was fire in the night and cloud during daytime and um, then they, they came into a situation where it seemed like God had deliberately led the Israelites into a trap so um, in front of them there was this huge red sea they couldn't cross and behind and left and right of them there were deserts and behind them the, uh, um, the king Pharaoh with all his troops so they were in a trap and what happened in that situation is, or what, what got revealed is the, the level of faith that the Israelites have. And also we could see uh, the heart of Pharaoh, um, who, uh, Pharaoh who had a hardened uh, heart and who um, really didn't change even though he saw God's um, uh, miracles. So in the end, even though uh, the Israelites were already out of Egypt, in their hearts they were still slaves of Egypt. But also what we can see through Moses, we can see that um, if a person is prepared in faith, if a person obeys, God is able to accomplish great things through this person if he is obedient. So um, preparing a person, a leader, a Christian leader, doesn't just mean that someone gets new abilities or new uh, powers. It's more about um, preparing the heart of this person. So. Um, it would be even better, rather than like uh, Moses being stubborn and uh, hardened for 80 years, the best thing would be if God calls that the person obeys and follows God and um, follows God's promises and covenants. So God is able to do great things through everyone who is willing to follow God, who is willing to be obedient. And still nowadays, God is looking for uh, people, co-workers, who are ready and willing to, uh, to follow his direction. So, what, so God is still calling us and is waiting for any Christian, any believer who responds to his call. And our church or our cell group, this uh, Holy Communion we have in this church is the place where we can grow within, uh, within our faith. And this is the place where we can be called and where we can show our obedience and um, devote our lives to God. And this church is a place where people grow in faith, uh, where they can devote their lives to God as interns or church leaders. And when, and in that situation, when we hear God's voice, when we hear, hear uh, God's calling, um, we should be ready. We should be like Moses, who was ready at a later time, and not like the Moses who was younger, uh, who, who was, um, who was younger and tried to do everything with his own power, or uh, we should make excuses like uh, that we're not ready, or we're not in the right situation, or we're just too busy. Because God doesn't look for people who have special skills or abilities. He's looking for people who are um, willing to, to be obedient and follow the path of, a path of faith. So showing or responding with excuses, of course th there are always reasons why someone couldn't be uh, ready at a certain time, but having excuses not following at a certain time can delay God's, uh, God's calling. So when God calls us to a place of growth and maturity, 
this is the chance also with answering uh, his call also to grow as a Christian because always trying to avoid God's call in the end can lead into a life that is stubborn and in severe cases it can even uh, lead into a uh, life that is far away from faith or even can be deceived um, by Satan, Satan's lies. So um, when God calls, calls us, let's be ready, let's use the, uh, God's calling as a chance to grow and mature in faith and I pray and hope that all members of this church can live a blessed life as interns, leaders or co-workers of God's calling. And I'm positive, I believe that even though we might be limited, God's, uh, our God is strong and in times of crisis he will help us to grow and year by year we'll grow in faith and we'll, we'll be able to accomplish bigger things through the Lord. So every one of, of us, we might think that we are weak, but as God is a, is a big and strong God, if we face a crisis, as long as we obey God's work, God will um, make things happen. So um, even in that situation, in the crisis where these Israelites were in front of the Red Sea and the Egyptian army behind them, Moses knew the reason for this crisis. He knew that there is a bigger sense behind this. So he was able to um, make a bold and surprising declaration. So in verse 13, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So this is a very wonderful and a very bold declaration of faith. This is not a nonsense or maybe arrogance. It, it could seem like, like uh, it's, it's just nonsense uh, with, with, uh, with the army behind you and the sea in front of you. But in the end, Moses had faith. And I also pray that you, when you face any uh, crisis in your life, that you will also be able to cry out such an amazing confession of faith. And that we will be able to show other people around us uh, what a path of life and blessing is. So let this confession of faith that Moses gave also become our life confession. So after Moses made this proclamation, he followed the commandment of God and he stretched out his arm, his staff over the sea and a wind came from the east and began to blow and part of the sea. So now the miracle of the Red Sea is something very complicated uh, to, to explain. Also, a lot of scholars and scientists try to explain. And some people thought that, uh, uh, believe or think that it's just like a low tide, right? Like a low tide that you see in the sea and that the water is a bit, bit lower so that there's some dry land and you can cross the sea. But the Bible is quite clear on this, very clear on this. Um, it's not that it was just a low tide. Um, Verse 22, for example, clearly states that the, the, the water uh, st uh, was uh, re receded like walls on the left and the right of the Israelites crossing the sea. So, of course, it's, it's not like in the movies where the, the sea just uh, splits up in a couple of seconds. So, um, the Bible um, describes it a bit differently. But still, the, the sea was clearly parted. And in chapter, in, in verse seven, uh, 27, um, when the water stopped like that, in, in verse 27, it started flowing again. And it clearly states that the um, horsemen and the chariots, Pharaoh's army, who followed the, um, the Israelites who the, the crossed the Red Sea, they were all buried under the great stream of water. So we believe that this was a factual historical event. And um, that event was testified by Moses, but also all the people of Israel who witnessed the incident. And of course, even the Egyptians had to witness what they saw. So when you watch movies about uh, Moses, for example, uh, The Prince of Egypt, the animation movie, um, it seems like uh, when, as soon as Moses held out, held out his staff, the Red Sea just parted in an instant. Um, but um, if we look close into the Bible, we see that um, it was a long, longer process. So then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, a wind came from the east and blew, and um, made the sea water uh, recede all night until the sea became dry land. So it took longer. Um, it didn't happen instantly. And it also tells how the angels who were leading the Israelites, they went behind the is Israelites to block the Egyptian army. Also, the pillar of cloud um, 
um, went between the Israelites and the Egyptians to defend them or to block them. So it, it took ho- the whole night to divide the sea. So what we, we can understand is that the bottom of the sea was exposed after, a, uh, after enough time had passed so to become dry land. And um, we have to understand the bottom of the sea, the ground of the sea, is uh, different in each te- uh, terrain. So um, even if it is um, and dry, that doesn't necessarily mean that the floor is even so that people easily can walk through the sea. Um, but uh, according to the Bible, the, the floor was relatively flat, flat enough that uh, Pharaoh's chariots and, and horsemen could pass as well. So maybe um, with the wind, something like, like sand also blowed into the floor t- so they got even. So we, we can understand that, that the condition of the sea was that people and also chariots of Pharaoh could cross. So reading the Bible, it seems like the Egyptian army followed the Israelites for a couple of days and on one specific morning or during the early day, they uh, found the sea uh, divided or parted. And uh, while they struggled to attack the Israelites because of, of the angels and the, cl- uh, and the pillar that got uh, put between them, later the day, the road was opened and then the, the, um, the army of, of, of Pharaoh started charging and following the Israelites. Now, um, looking at today's uh, um, map of the Red Sea, we cannot find the exact point where the Israelites crossed the, the Red Sea. Uh, so there are a lot of different speculations or uh, theories. Um, so the Red Sea referred in the Bible is called the Red Sea from the Gulf of Aden um, in the uh, present day Somalia, uh, Somalian Peninsula. Um, but uh, another area, um, the, the Gulf of Suez and the, uh, on the left and the Gulf of the Aqaba on the right, they are also, this area is also called Red Sea. So the Red Sea is not just a small spot, it's a larger area. So if you look at the map, um, the places that we uh, traditionally know from, from, from historical uh, researches are shown as solid black lines. Um, but in addition to uh, to the black line, the, the, the traditional path that, that we assume was the, was the path that the Israelites walked uh, or um, traveled, there are also some other um, newer um, theories. So there, 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 there are a couple of more um, places or, or paths that the Israelites might have um, traveled. Uh, so there are more, the, more possibilities than just one uh, clear answer on that. So, according to traditional interpretation, the miracle of the Red Sea would occur at the Suez Bay. Uh, um, when the King Pharaoh looked at the Israels, um, he thought that the Israelites were in a trap and that it would be a good uh, opportunity to, to attack them. And um, this area could probably be the end of the Sinai Peninsula. Um, so, there, there is a probability that the Israelites crossed uh, cross the Red Sea in the area of the Arabian Peninsula or uh, in many other cases also um, it is assumed that they crossed the Gulf of Aqaba rather than the Gulf of Suez. Um, and again some other scholars uh, argue that the part of the Strait of Tyran might be the most plausible um, crossing path because of the seafloor condition, the, the, the base of the sea. Uh, so um, why people claim that the um, that the Gulf of Aqaba might be most plausible is uh, some um, some traces of wheels and other um, other parts of chariots, obviously that were used in the 18th dynasty of Egypt, were found in the in the in the ground of the sea, and also um, a pillar was discovered, which obviously um, was built at King Solomon's time and which actually marked the place where um, the ancestors crossed the Red Sea by King Solomon. So when we look at those relics on the Saudi Arabian side, um, when we consider that that more than two million people would have have to stay together and also cross the sea and and travel together, um, it could make more sense to believe that the uh, Mount Lao Lao on the Arabian side fits the biblical explanation more than the uh, 
the, the Mount Sinai that we traditionally know today. Also, the length of the Gulf of Aqaba is 160 kilometers from north to south, and the maximum width is around 24 kilometers, and the depth of the sea at this deepest point is 1,850 meters, and uh, the condition of the seafloor, the sea ground, is really important because we have to understand people have to, to cross the sea, so de depending on how the sea ground looks like, um, it might be more plausible um, to understand which area the Israelites used to cross the sea. So um, the middle part of, uh, of Median in Nueva looks like a, more or less, it looks like a bridge if you look at the topographic map. And in this terrain, the, um, it gently descends at a 6 degree slope from the end um, then gently ascends to the opposite shore. And the length of the crossing is around 13 kilometers. And the width of this dam in the sea, which looks like a bridge, is about 6 kilometers from side to side. And uh, the deepest water depth is around 120 uh, meters. With the equipment that we have nowadays, um, a, a more accurate investigation was done. So. Um, so with more accurate um, investigations and, and measurements, uh, the understanding is that the, uh, that the water rapidly descends to a depth of 263 meters from the beach when crossing the Egyptian side. It goes up for around 5 kilometers on a flat surface and then goes down for a length of 2.5 kilometers to a maximum depth of 765 meters again. And when it touches the bottom, it goes up for 2.5 kilometers and when it reaches a depth of 285 kilometers, um, it a uh, uh, relatively flat terrain follows for about five kilometers until uh, we then reach the Saudi Arabian uh, side. So, I mean, since since the um, this incident happened more than uh, around three and a half thousand years ago, maybe the topo topography uh, may have changed uh, during those years. Um, but what we understand is, is in general the the. Uh, uh, the sea was quite difficult for a large number of people to cross. Um, so, um, the, what we can understand is that there are various possible routes for the exodus to happen. And um, at this point nowadays, uh, the, uh, today, um, there's um, no theory that satisfies all conditions. So, uh, um, based on the historical circumstances and the evidence we have uh, uh, that remain today, uh, we can only speculate uh, which area is most probable. But um, whether we understand it the traditional way or the newer investigations, it is clear that um, crossing the Red Sea as, as humans, as a large group of humans, uh, was something that was impossible on their own. The only way to cross that sea was through a miracle or a miraculous work of God. So, um, and also what we should believe is that the crossing of the Red Sea was a clear historical fact. Um, there, and there's another theory. Um, the, the word or the expression Red Sea doesn't appear in the original Hebrew Bible. Uh, the, the original Hebrew Bible mentions a sea of reeds. So some people say that um, it, it, the, the, the Israelites didn't really uh, cross the Red Sea, they just passed through a reed forest. But then looking at the Bible, um, it's even more surprising that all the Egyptians drowned in such a reed forest or just a, uh, just a very shallow sea. So um, just... Um, Explaining it as a, a simple read for us is even more implausible if we believe the Bible. So now understanding that the original Hebrew uh, Bible said uh, Sea of Reeds, how did it change to the Red Sea? Um, we understand that it happened in Alexandria in Egypt in the 3rd century before Christ and it were Jews who translated the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament into Greeks back then, and when the Septuagint Bible uh, the, um, the, um, uh, came out, it was already translated as the Red Sea. So in the first um, translation, the Sea of Reeds was translated into the Red Sea. And from the Greek Bible, when it got translated into the Latin Bible, the, uh, the Latin Vulgate also uh, came out without modification. It also mentioned the Sea of Reeds at the Red Sea. And from translating the Latin Bible into English, nowadays, for example, the King James Bible that we use nowadays, 
all the Bibles um, after the Greek Bible use the Red Sea as the sea that the, uh, the Israelites uh, um, crossed. There are also some people, I mean, this is, that doesn't make much sense, but some people think that the Red Sea, if you just, just uh, um, skip one of the E's, it becomes the Red Sea, but of course this is highly improbable and historically very, very inaccurate. Um, but still, the question is still open. When the Jews translated the Hebrew Bible into the Greek, um, they knew that it meant the Sea of Reeds, but why did they still translate into the Red Sea, even though they knew better? Um, there's no way to know it for sure, but obviously, it is highly probable that at that time, the, uh, the Sea of Reeds was actually the same like the Red Seas, and the Hebrew knew that if, we, if they would just write the Sea of Reeds, other people wouldn't understand because they don't know this expression that, that obviously was used locally or just within their um, um, culture. So they used the Red Sea to be more accurate or to, to use the name that it was wider spread. And the explanation why the Red Sea got its name, um, there, there are also various um, explanations and theories. Some people believe uh, that the Red Sea um, has a lot of coral reefs um, growing on the shore and when the water is pushed back during the full moon in, in low tides, the coral reefs submerge and um, become visible closer to the surface and uh, because the corals are red, the whole water has a red color. So some people think that this was the reason why they called it Red Sea. Uh, another theory, another reason might be that, the, that to the east of the Gulf of Aqaba, uh, from the Arabian Peninsula, the Persian Gulf, um, there's a large mountain which is red colored and obviously because the, the large red mountain is close to the sea, maybe it reflects on the water. This is why some people also uh, call it uh, Red Sea because the sea looked red. Um, so. Regardless whether it's a Red Sea or the Reed Sea, what we, we can clearly see is um, all the explanation seem to refer to the same place. And the Hebrews back then that translated uh, the Bible in Egypt um, knew that the Sea of Reeds Reed was the same place like the Red Sea. Um, and this is why they translated um, or used the expression Red Sea in the Greek Bible. So going back to the main text, the, um, the King Pharaoh didn't believe that God was the real God until the very end. He was stubborn to the very end, he pursued them, and um, then in the middle of the Red Sea, he, uh, his army followed the Israelites with their chariots and horsemen, his whole army, um, but then they were all killed and buried in the Red Sea. And after the Israelites and the people, uh, and the people of Israel um, witnessed this incident, they finally started to become more firm in their faith and they started to believe in the Lord, that, that God is alive. And they also uh, started to trust Moses, who was God's servant, more than before. And when we, this, this was the history of chapter 14, and when we um, follow up on the chapter 15, we see that Moses and all the people of Israel who witnessed this, this uh, w wonderful work of God, uh, and they witnessed this with their own eyes, they start to praise and worship God as their Savior, Savior and the Almighty God. And then up to the verse 21, um, all the people, all this right, acknowledge and exalt God, um, and they are all joyful and they all rejoice and are happy as witnesses of the great work of the living God. And this great and wonderful news spread beyond the, the people of Israel, it, it spread beyond Egypt, uh, it, it spread to all the uh, countries surrounding them. So if we pay close attention to verse 14 and 15 in the Song of Moses and the people, um, we understand that God's work uh, and his accomplishments were transmitted to the Philistines, the Edomites, and the Moabites, and the Canaanites. And the other people, the other uh, nations were shocked and discouraged by what they heard. And um, now, with this we can understand that the great name of God were, was spread all over the nations, 
and all over the surrounding nations uh, who didn't know God before. So uh, God revealed himself and he proclaimed that he's the real creator, that he's the real uh, God to all the nations. And um, later, when they took over the land of Canaan, there was a prostitute named uh, Rahab in the city of Jericho, and she had heard of the, of the Israelites and their God before, and um, that was a special case or wonderful case of salvation, even in, 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 the, in the place in the history of destruction, because this person, Rahab, was, was willing to believe. So, um, God's miracles are not meant to frighten and scare people. They are um, a gospel, they are good news, and um, they are meant to let the people know that God is the true God. So, we nowadays also continue to hear God's voice, God's calling. Um, every day, every week when we come to church, uh, we hear God's, uh, God's word. Nowadays, if we look at the news, if we look at the media, um, there are many incidents that happen in churches that we unfortunately have to be ashamed of um, and some people might ask what the hell are the people in the church doing why are the churches or the church leaders behaving like that but even through such situations even nowadays God's voice is still calling so everything in this world the nature the culture everything is praising God and if we look at the Bible, if we look at the history of the Bible starting with Genesis to, to the present day, sometimes there are things in the Bible we would rather hide or that we are not very proud of. But the Bible doesn't hide it. God doesn't hide it. And He, he is very open. He shows everything that happened, everything He did. And in the end, this is the truth of God and that um, allows us to witness God. And that's the reason why we as Christians um, have to be open. We have to open our mouths, our hearts, and uh, we have to be witnesses that makes other people understand and, and know God around us. And that's the life of light and soul that shows what the gospel is. And um, so we all must be um, believers and Christians who live a life that follows the values of the, of the word. And um, we shouldn't spread just religion by force. Um, but we should be people just like the people of Israel who experience God's wonderful work even through now, uh, today's text. And we must be filled with joy, with emotion, with love and grace in our lives. And we have to show this um, by a life that walks with God. So the, this Bible, God's Word um, confesses what God has done. And we can see how God uh, worked, worked through people. And God is an unchanging God. And uh, there should be a revival of understanding the truth of God, a revival uh, to understand God's love and, and also God's pity for the people. And we, when we are really filled with God's joy, um, our life automatically will become, become a life of evangelism because we won't be able to hide it. We'll be filled with joy. And this, and this can be seen or understood through the, uh, the Israelites who experienced the miracle of the Red Sea in, in Exodus. And those people who experience and who can confirm the amazing existence of God, they are so happy that they dance, that they praise and they worship God. They cannot hide it, they cannot be stopped. And this kind of praise, this kind of joy or, or a gratefulness doesn't come from uh, someone who forcibly uh, tries to, to, uh, to persuade you, who forcibly shouts Amen. This comes from someone who is filled with real joy. Um, he, it comes from someone who personally meet and saw, met and saw the truth of God. And I'm convinced if you're filled with that joy, this joy will burst out of you uncontrollably, unstoppable. So this kind of joy, this true joy and emotion, can only be experienced when we see the true work of God. It is possible when we meet the truth of God. And this is, and, and it's a joy when we understand a God who was willing to sacrifice his own son. It is, it is possible when we understand that God gave up his own son for my life. Unfortunately, when we look at churches, there, there are people um, who seem to be very faithful, who seem to be very motivated and very sincere. 
but their motivation isn't the truth of God. It is their own motivation. It is their own goal, own targets, own will for success in their lives. And um, even though being very motivated, very sincere in church, it can feel or it can lead into idolatry um, if it is filled with greediness um, and if it's not really... Um, it, and that's no sincerity. In the end, this is selfishness. So God has to touch our heart. We have to meet a God that truly touches our heart and, and, and our faith shouldn't be uh, motivated by selfishness or our own greed. So the miracle of Exodus was not the result of any uh, human selfishness or greed. It was a work of God, sincere love for His people. So God didn't, didn't uh, save His people because they asked for it. In the end, God saved His people because He loved His people. He wanted to save them. It was His plan, His greater plan. So the, the miracle of Exodus was only possible because um, there were people like Moses who believed in God's sincerity and obeyed His words. He, he obeyed his promises and he was willing to risk his own life to follow God's commandments and he wasn't looking at the people he wasn't acting according to what people expected or what they hoped and thought he purely followed God's commandments so that's why through the history of the Bible and also um, by studying the book of Exodus I hope that we all more than anything else will meet the sincerity of God to understand that God loves people and this is clearly shown through the Bible and the history of the Israelites and um, being born again needs to meet God's truth to meet God's real heart and in order to meet God's truth and in order to become born again we must know the Bible and the history correctly and completely and it's only through the Bible the truth in God's Word that contains the, the work of God that we can see and meet the truth of God so when we meet the truth of God we will change and we can be changed no matter uh, how much despair and pain we might face in our current situation or environment and when we meet the truth of God we can truly live a life of, of as a witness that cannot be hidden so uh, looking forward to the rest of 2022 to the end of this year um, God led his people out of Egypt he and I hope that we all can experience God's work and miracles um, in our lives and live a life like a new creation uh, and that we can be people of God's kingdom. The field of mission is given to us and God is calling us and I hope that we all will be able to walk the, the path of faith, faith with joy and um, that we are joyful of meeting God's truth. So the purpose of our existence is to live as a real witness of God and of Jesus. And um, we, shouldn't, we should consider that it is not possible through religious training or because of, uh, of someone else forcing us. It's only possible through meeting God personally, meeting God's truth and understanding His heart. And I pray that you all will come across the true will of God through the Word um, day by day. So next week we'll uh, continue and look at the history of the Israelites after uh, they crossed the Red Sea and their follow-up journey. So let's pray.